Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Molly Elmore. Today we're going to talk about Gresham's Law and the idea or question, you know, if the world moved back to sound money, let's say a gold, a gold standard or asset backed currencies or even something like Bitcoin, you know, would the world sort of embrace that quickly? Or would there be challenges and problems? And there would be, which is called Gresham's Law, and we're going to break that down. Uh, welcome to the show. A couple days ago, there was an announcement in the news that Ghana is going to start uh, using gold that they mine in their country to purchase oil. And it kind of raises this question that comes up every couple of months. It's come up with the BRICS nations as well. You know, if we saw these sort of countries outside of the United States start to transact with gold backed currencies, would that sort of force through game theory? the West and the US to sort of adopt that as well. And it's a great question. I mean, game theory ideas like if, you know, I'm gonna force your hand by making a move that you have to react to in a certain way. And in the case of this sort of the ideas, you know, if there was a bunch of different options for currencies and you could, and you're an independent country and you could pick from gold backed currency, or you could pick from fiat that can be printed at will. Part of the sort of logical argument would be like, well, of course I would pick the gold backed currency because it will hold its value over a longer period of time. Well, it's not that simple though, when you break down kind of how it really works in our world run by nation states and countries that issue rules around currency. So we're going to break down today what is known as Gresham's law. So this law is sort of an, an economic principle. It's not like a legal law, uh, sort of like the law of gravity type of idea. All right, this came into being back in the 1500s when a guy named Thomas Gresham uh, worked for the Queen of England. And he later went on and founded the Royal Exchange in the city of London. So what had happened was, is that Henry VIII uh, had decided to change sort of the composition of the coins that were used in England at the time. This was before paper bills and all money was done with, you know, actual metal coins. And the coins were made with a high percentage of silver, which was sort of how, you know, kind of like back in the gold standard, silver standard era, you know, silver and gold had value and that was sort of turned into a coin and therefore the coin had the value of the metal that was used to make it. Well, you know, as is very tempting when you are the issuer of the currency, he decided that he was going to like melt a bunch of these down and sort of mix in some other base metals, make new coins. Therefore he, you know, he kind of printed fiat money essentially, he sort of printed money out of nothing. Uh, and that's not really the definition of fiat money, but he, he artificially increased the supply without going out and digging up more silver from the ground. Now, what happened though, was that people figured it out and I'm not exactly sure how, maybe it looked different or weighed different or felt different or something. But the idea with this sort of story is that people figured it out and they were able to tell the difference. And so what they were doing was they were spending the new sort of mixed coins and they were hoarding the older silver coins because in this analogy, the new coins were sort of the bad money. They, and here's why this matters, because the government, in this case, Henry VIII, said that these two coins in the eye of the law are worth the same thing. Let's say they were both worth a shilling whatever, it doesn't matter. This coin is a shilling and this coin is a shilling. But the people knew that one shilling was used higher value ingredients, essentially, and another shilling used lower value ingredients. So they weren't really the same, but the government, not a free market, had said these two things in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of legal tender are technically the same purchasing power. So what people did is they were like, ah, well, okay, 
you say they're equal, but we don't really think they're equal. And what they did is they were spending as quickly as, or as quickly as ne was needed, the bad money, and they were hoarding the good money. Uh, and this is sort of this idea that bad money will drive out good money from circulation. So the good money sort of left the economy, it went in someone's piggy bank, and the bad money was what was being used to barter, you know, uh, not really barter, but exchange value by goods and services. So let's fast forward now to, now here's one thing I wanna qualify. Let's go back to Henry VIII's time. If there had been no rules and people were allowed to assign value to these currencies in sort of a free market sense, then you would have been able to buy more with that coin with higher silver and you wouldn't have, you would have bought less to have purchasing power with that lower quality coin. But because government got involved, which is usually the source of many problems, governments involved, they're essentially price fixing these shillings it creates these conditions for Gresham's law. And this matters because we're going to talk about gold in a second, but it also fits into the world of CBDCs, which may or may not come, we're still unclear. All right, so let's say we move to a gold-backed currency and you're a country in Africa somewhere and you got a lot of gold that you make there. So the government issues now a second currency. We have our original fiat money, and now we have this new gold-backed money. And if, and if the government says, you know what, for all intents and purposes, they are the same, like one old dollar is the same as one gold dollar, what will likely happen is the same thing, is that people will hoard the gold dollars and go out and spend the old ones so that they get rid of them because you don't wanna hold on to something that's gonna lose its value, right? Where you would potentially want to store for long-term savings the higher value token. So if uh, now this, this law has its limits, and if you got into a situation where the bad money got so bad, likely due to a situation of hyperinflation, then like, you know, economics and supply chains and all these things, they love sort of stability and the things will go one way or the other. But if we reached a point where the bad money got so bad, a new law kicks in called Thier's Law. I think that's how you say it. It's T-H-I-E-R, Thier's Law. And that's when you've crossed this sort of tipping point, and now the good money takes over because the bad money got so bad, nobody wants to use it. So the idea here is that let's say CBDCs were introduced in a country. The, and we're actually seeing this in some African countries that they've been beta testing it. Nobody wants to use the CBDC. Well, let's say the CBDC came out and it was kind of perceived to be, the government tells you that this is better. This is now our, our new money, our good money. Um, well, and your regular money you've had for a while, your fiat money, they'll tell you that's gonna be going away or you know that it's losing its purchasing power for some type of reason. It's sort of that same thing, like I'd wanna use up all my old money before using this new money. That's sort of one way to look at it. And this is kind of why like uh, a year ago, I had this conversation, I mean, it was a while ago, a conversation with somebody about Bitcoin, a Bitcoin Max, you're really passionate about it. We sort of had this discussion that nobody was using it to buy stuff. And it was kind of this attitude of like, well, it's kind of dumb. If I think Bitcoin's gonna become worth a million dollars a coin, it's kind of dumb for me to spend it like at, on groceries right now, which is a challenge with you. If you had a monetary system where people believed, it doesn't matter what's true or not, what matters is that they believe it, that it's going to increase in value dramatically. I mean, I know that a lot of you watching this are XRP holders. XRP now is like what, 30 cents something? 30-ish something cents. If you believe XRP, let's even say, is going to be worth $1,000 one day, kind of seems silly to go out and spend a whole bunch of XRP on something when that would be worth a lot more in the future. So that's sort of this idea too of Gresham's Law is that it's hard for these newer assets that people believe has long-term value potential to get used now 
because of Gresham's law that the good, the bad money is going to stick around because people are going to want to save the things that they think are going to appreciate. And this is oddly, as I'm sort of thinking aloud, this is an argument for why a central bank would like inflation. Central banks don't really want everyone to save their money. They want an economy where people are constantly exchanging value. This is measured by velocity of money. And, you know, if you look at, you know, right now we just had Black Friday and Cyber Monday and this sort of big holiday shopping season in, in the U.S. and other shopping oriented countries. And the way that's often measured is like how much money did people spend over these holiday weekends? Nobody's ever looking at like how much money do people save over the holidays? Like the measure of health of an economy is sometimes looked at by sort of the rate of spending. So if you had a monetary system where the money was always going up in value, it was appreciating, would people be less eager to spend Probably because, you know, you're like, well, I could spend this hundred dollars on movie tickets, or I could just save it knowing that in a year from now, it's going to be worth $120 or whatever. Uh, a monetary unit that goes up in value is sort of, you're going to feel discouraged from spending it. So is that one of the reasons why central banks like inflation is because if you know your money's losing value, you might as well go and spend it. And so this sort of fits into this Gresham's Law idea that if something came along to challenge it that seemed like great, like a better idea, people might buy it and hoard it, but are they going to actually use it for day-to-day -day transactions when this other money is already in place? Um, it kind of brings up some interesting questions. And on the flip side, I've often asked myself, and I still do, if countries decided to implement a central bank digital currency, a retail one that had some of these sort of dystopian elements that, that we don't want, like, you know, social credit score integration or limits on what you could purchase because of like a carbon credit thing, or even something like an expiration date to help keep the velocity of money high. Like I, I've I asked myself this a lot, maybe I'm like a CBDC geek, but you know, what would they have to do to make everybody embrace this new thing? And I've had a couple of ideas. You know, one is they could just give you a whole bunch of free money. One is they could give you an incredible exchange rate where you get like, you know, twice as much of the new money as the old ones. There's a bunch of ways they could sweeten the deal in the beginning, but they still have to make it so that you will use it. So it can't really be better than the old one unless they decide to make the old money illegal, which they could totally do. And again, this is where you're getting into this situation where the government meddling is going to probably be the bigger variable than whether or not one thing is genuinely more valuable than another or perceived to be because we've got these, these mandates coming in. And so if they made the money, uh, the new CBDC expire, kind of like a gift card, then it would, push people to use it because it's like a use it or lose it thing. So if I had, you know, my secret stash of Bitcoin or I had a bunch of CBD that's going to expire at the end of the month, I'm probably going to use the one that's going to expire, right? Why not? So that's a pretty compelling way to force not only adoption, but to force usage. Because if I give you a bunch of money and it's use it or lose it, People are going to feel kind of foolish not to, to spend it. So, you know, as we kind of, and, and here's the deal, I don't have the answers on what's going to happen with CBDCs. I think it's also not going to be the same thing in every country around the world. Uh, lately, I've been studying this sort of newer aspect of it where it's kind of a, what's called a CBDC backed stable coin. I'm going to do a video on that shortly once I sort of have my head wrapped around that whole idea. Uh, but just be prepared that. I, th I do strongly believe we are moving to a new monetary system that will incorporate digital assets and blockchain technology in a very different way than we currently have. And that's going to mean that for many of us, if not most of us, the monetary system will change and there will likely have to be government policy to force that adoption. And it's going to be related to something like Gresham's law where 
some kind of government rule will have to dictate the value of the old asset versus the new asset. And it might appear at first like, oh, yay, well, the new ones or the old ones better. So people won't use the new one because the old one's better. Well, that's sort of this Gresham's law idea and that the bad money will chase out the good money. So it can sort of sound counterintuitive at first, but not, not when you think about it, because if there's something that's going to happen to one, one of the money supply or one of the money types, it's going to expire or it's going to lose value due to inflation or some other qualifier that means in the long term it won't have purchasing power then people will spend it because that use it or lose it concept is very powerful. So just wanted to introduce Gresham's Law. This won't be a long video today. I do appreciate all of you who watch these videos. Uh, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you find these insightful. And I do thank all of you who leave me very kind and constructive comments. It's very appreciated. <laughs> Lately on Twitter, I've had my couple of sort of just mean people like attacking threads I write for no constructive reason. So it does make me appreciate those of you who are <laughs> nice. I don't mind feedback or suggestions or even criticism. I just ask that you do it like, like you would in person, like respectfully. And uh, the majority of you do that. So thank you very much for that. All right. I will see you in the next video.